Exodus chapter 1. I want us, as you read verse 12, read, we read, we read it. Notice the wording. And it's very strange um, as far as man is concerned. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And the Bible says, and they, that's those who are afflicting the Jews, that's the Egyptians, they became grieved because of the children of Israel. I want to read that again. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the trend of Israel. I want to speak for a few minutes on expanding in your dark days. Expanding in your dark days. Well, Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to be in your house and thank you for the way you've helped me. And God, would you help your people? Would you encourage your people? And God, all you want from us is just lay our eyes like down. It's just surrender to you. In our own human strength, it's difficult. We like to struggle. We like to fight. God, in this, you, you allow some events to take place in our lives. And God, tonight, I want to thank you. I want to glorify your name for you are in control. So do that which only you can. Save the lost, revive the saints, encourage your people to keep on keeping on, even in these times, to expand and broaden the horizon. For we serve a powerful God. Hide me behind the cross. Take your word on and exalt yourself. We ask in Christ and for his sake. Amen. Now, the book of Exodus is written... And then Genesis is before Exodus. I want us to get a little glimpse of what is happening. You see, Genesis ends with Jacob. After believing and recognizing his son Joseph, who was claimed was dead, is now alive. And Jacob... And his sons and the children took a journey into Egypt. I want us to note the background to this. In Genesis 37 and verse 8, Joseph, who's now the Savior, is hated by his brothers. That's not nice. It's not nice to be hated by your own blood relative. It's not nice to be at war with your own blood relatives. They're saying that blood is thicker than water. But when, when, you, when, when there is animosity between family, it's a really grieving thing. There is no po as far as you, we can see, there is no positive stuff in that. But here we have a case of Joseph being hated by his brothers. Genesis 37 and verse 8. Joseph is cast into a pit. It's a deep dungeon. It's darkness. In Genesis 37 and verse number 28. Joseph is sold as a slave. He's sold by his own brothers. Where is God in that? Where is, where is the grace and mercy of God in that? At that particular time when that is taking place. In Genesis 37. 30 and 37. Jacob is told a lie that his son is dead. He goes into mourning and refuses to be comforted. How many times we refuse the help from God? When there is something in our minds, in our hearts, 
some situation that we have no answer for. Genesis 39, 7 to 27, Joseph is put in prison for rejecting the offer from his master's wife. He is doing right. He is doing what he's supposed to do as a young man. Yet he's sent to jail. Where is God? Where is he? In Genesis 40, verse 23, he helps those in prison and they forget him. They are not grateful. They are not thankful for help that he gave them. How many times have we helped people and they're not grateful, they're not thankful, and they forget everything that we've done for them? When you recognize people are unthankful and holy, where is God? You spent your life, spent your earnings, spent everything you have helping somebody. Holding the rope. Then they turn their back on you. But in Genesis 41, 39 to 44, Joseph is now risen to number two in Egypt. I want to propose to you tonight that in all of these negatives, Joseph was in the sovereign will of God. I want to propose to you tonight that in all of these negatives in the life of Joseph, that God was still in charge. And God was still working behind the scenes to accomplish his purpose and then Joseph made this revelation to his brothers when they recognized who he was and were scared. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So I can become a savior to you today. That's the situation. So Jacob and his sons gets up out of a protection where they're supposed to be and goes to Egypt, which is the type of the world, for help. Right. Many preachers have, and we understand the context, that you're not supposed to go to Egypt. Right. I will suggest to you sometimes that God would use Egypt to benefit his people. Sure. It's an amazing thing that God does. God is supreme. God is sovereign. Right. God can do anything he wants to do. Right. Right. You and I can't put God in a box. I had to learn that through hard times. I had to learn that. So not with me, the people of the dark days. In Exodus chapter 1 from 2 to 4, gives the generation, gives the names of those who went into Egypt. In fact, in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says there are about 70 souls who went with Jacob. Who are they? They are God's people. They are God's chosen people. They are the apple of God's eyes. I'm going to stop for a while and say that we are not immune from issues or dark days in our lives even if we are God's people. In fact, I'm convinced now that God allowed dark days to draw us close to him. And we'll see that. That his glory be revealed in our lives right. in dark days. Right. Sure. It is no doubt that we are faced with dark days. Sure. All around the world. I was saying the preacher, it's like the, the whole world is, the earth is just spewing out stuff. It's like everything is turning upside down, inside out. It's like the church of Jesus Christ, and we know it's not, we'll not go through the tribulation, but it's like untold persecution. Buckle your seatbelt. It's about to come. And you will understand me. 
I'm not involved in politics. I don't. In fact, this message is based on keep your eyes on him. Not on the White House or the Grey House or Grong House or any politician or any businessman, the, 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 your boss and, and all that stuff, your education. That is, these are God's people. Secondly, there's an important point I want to note here. Look at verse number six. The Bible says, and Joseph died. Watch this. And all his brethren and all that generation. Hold on a while. That Pharaoh who appointed Joseph, number two, died. All that generation of that Pharaoh died. Next verse says that. Died. Not just that. Joseph died and all the generation died. There arose another generation who did not know of the significance of Joseph to Egypt. I'm a Christian, I'm telling you, if I were to have my way, I would rather stay in the time when Joseph was alive and had preeminence. So I'm protected and sheltered. Are we okay? People who know what Joseph meant to Egypt. You'd like to stay in that time and not the dark days to come. If we have a choice. But I'm looking at this, Big Doug, and I'm recognizing there is a passing that must take place, takes place in our lives for God to move and for God to work. I'll repeat that. There must be a passing in our lives be before God can on and God can move us forward. There is a passing. Joseph died. And all that generation. And so I'm thinking, there has to be a passing in life. There has to be a passing of your loved ones. Whether it's in physical death or relationship broken. You and I struggle with that. I love my blood brothers. I love my physical form. I love them. And sometimes we hold ourselves in bondage and refuse to go forward and go through the door that God has opened so that tomorrow we can be a blessing to them. But for me to go forward, I must let go. There has to be a break. There has to be a passing. Of loved ones. Not just a passing of loved ones. Sometimes there has to be a passing of jobs. Sometimes you lose your job. Your security. What you've depended on for years. As far as you're concerned in the middle of dark days because I lost my job. What am I going to do? How am I going to provide my family? What's going to happen? There's a passing sometimes of loved ones. There's a passing of jobs. Sometimes marriage breaks up. Could I say that again? Sometimes marriages break up. And for you to go forward, there must be a passing. If you can't move forward, Unless there is a passing. That's difficult to say. But I mean, there's a sovereign God in heaven. There's a passing in marriage that we have to let go of. There's a passing in relationships. I don't know about you. I was a young man growing up. You know, young men had seen ladies, and you, you, you see everybody. You, you think that's the best person for me. And it does not work out. And you beat yourself, and you think, why in the world? God knows best. 
he shuts that person down because he has someone better for you. And for a blessing to come, for you to move forward, there has to be a passing in the relationship, not just as far as men, women is concerned, but relationship with people. And we listen, I, I don't know about you, maybe I'm the less spiritual person here. But but when I have a relationship with somebody, I mean, I try to cultivate that. I try I try to do anything to please that person and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden they just they just drop like a hot potato. And you, you try to examine yourself and say, why in the world have I done anything wrong? No, you did not do anything wrong. God wants to move you on. As far as relationship with people. By the way, there's nothing wrong with them. But God intervenes. Because he has better plans for you. He wants to move you on to a higher level. So relationship, there has to be a passing sometimes in our lives. There has to be a passing the time in your life. One of the hardest things for me is recognize I'm getting old. Brother Doug, you feel you can do things that you used to. And we beat ourselves and we try to keep going just like we were when it was 17, 18, 19, 21. But our bodies can't take it. We've got to understand that there has been a passing of times in our lives. That we have to use our experiences now to help the younger ones coming up. And if you don't watch it, these are dark days. They call it midlife crisis. Good night. The, 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 the lady, the men have midlife crisis, ladies have menopause. We always get blamed, men. Menopause. We don't know much about that, but listen to me. There, 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 there is a time in your life, a crisis proportion, when you cannot do what you used to. And the quicker we acknowledge that, the better for us. The quicker we allow God to move us, the better. So there's the passing period in our lives that I see in that time of darkness. Why would you note something? There's the productivity of the Jews. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, and the children of Israel. Now read verse number 6 in context. And Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. Verse 7, the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. And multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. And the land was fooled with them. The word fruitful literally means a fruitful tree. In other words, they increase. In other words, the, their women and the men had a lot of children. By the time, now, well, stand that you know about involving the medical field. And uh, I've met one person who said when she's giving birth, she's often, Sister Josephine in our church, former teacher, she's retired now. She said when she's giving birth, she has no pain. Literally no pain. I say, you, you're not normal. <laughs> she just goes to the hospital and just boop. <laughs> Your ladies would like to be like her, wouldn't you? What I'm finding here, and I could be wrong, but I think I'm right as far as the scripture is concerned. These ladies and the men produce a lot of children. A lot. Not one. Not five. God just blessed them to multiply. The Bible says they increased abundantly. They became very numerous. 
But would you know that was a promise? Look with me in Genesis 46. That was a promise from God. That was a promise from God. Genesis 46, look at verse number 3. Genesis 46, verse 3. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will make of thee what? A great nation. Here's what we do in terms of darkness. We panic. In terms of darkness, we doubt the promise of the word of God. When difficult circumstances, let me, when difficult circumstances comes to me, you say a preacher, yes, but I doubt. I doubt. Yeah, yeah, God says it, but it's just in the word for Elijah and these guys. That's not for my generation. Every promise from God, he fulfills. Everything God says, he does. God always keeps his promises. The devil will tell you in times of darkness, in times of struggle, God is not real. God cannot meet the promises he made to you. The problem and issue is not with God, it's with us. God always keeps his promises. And I thank God for that. So they became very numerous. And God had promised that. The Bible says they wax exceedingly mighty. In other words, they were strong. They were able bodies. In other words, if you recognize people who work out in the field, there is something uniquely different about people who use their hands, masons, carpenters. Laborers compared to work, those who work in the office, and there's nothing wrong working in the office. It's a big difference. When they walk out, work out in the field and they work in their trade, they develop strong muscles. You get that? I mean, they don't have to go to the gym. I mean, it just, it just comes. They work in the concrete, they, they, they develop hard hands. Brother Ferdinand. I stupidly one day decide I'm going to put my hands and try to pull him. He always ripped my back off. Strong, I'm, I'm serious, strong brother. And, and, and what happened, these guys were working hard and they were able bodies. And that caused dread by the Egyptians. The Bible said the land was filled with them. They became numerous. They swamped the land. You go to Walmart, there they are. The Jews. You go to Sam's Club, there they are. Huh? You go to Eden Place, they are all over the place. They spread all over the place. Everywhere you go, it seemed like they are outnumbering the Egyptians. That was a promise from God. But note the promoting of that darkness. Huh. Verse number nine. He said unto his people, as the Pharaoh, behold the people of the children of Israel. Watch this are more mightier than we. Fear came into the hearts of Pharaoh and his people. So is the more in fear, the children of Israel are more than we are. Everywhere you go, you see them. They are multiplying too fast. That was a propaganda. Not just they are more, but they are mightier. Pharaoh is literally accusing the Jews of having more influence. More influence than the Egyptians. In the land of Egypt. And so Pharaoh is saying in verse number 10, watch this. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. Least they multiply and it come to pass that when... They fall out any war. They join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. You know what I get from this? 
Pharaoh enjoyed their labor, but not them. Pharaoh enjoyed the hard work, but didn't want them. So Pharaoh is saying, they are multiplying so fast. We've got to do something about them. Because if we don't, when the enemy comes against us, they'll join the enemy, destroy us, and we'll lose our free labor. So I want them, their labor. I want the benefit of having them. But I don't want them. Not the status of that darkness. Look at verse number 11. As a result of fear. By the way, let me just say this. We panicked in our time of darkness. And we squeezed the panic button. Maybe not you. My brother, brother. Doug Foster is a really nice spiritual brother. He never panics. I mean, I do. Especially the building program. For Doug, I don't want to say that often, but especially when I recognize we're not hearing from the government. In my own life, when things are not going my way, I hit the panic button, and I do things I ought not to do. I think of things I have not to think of. So here's what Pharaoh and the Egyptians did. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasures. In other words, they became slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh enslaved them. So Pharaoh told them, when you can eat, how long you can eat, how long you got to work? When you go for a meal, how long are you going to stay? In fact, it's amazing. They afflicted them, literally, they terrorized them. Verbally and physically. They terrorized the Jews. They placed them in forced labor. They built for Pharaoh treasure cities. Some estimate that the slavery lasted for 134 years. Others said it was 284 years. They made them to build cities and made their lives bitter. No wonder when Moses got to the top of the mountain. And the fire was being burned and not being burned. Moses said, why have not heard the cry of our people? Why? If you're the God that you say you are, why have not answered our cry? Because we have been tortured and slaughtered. And sometimes you and I ask the question, where is God in my darkness? Where is God in my situation? Where is God in my darkness? Where is God in my trouble? Where is he? Note with me, the expanding in the darkness. That's where verse number 12, our text verse comes in. All of these have given rise to verse number 12. And so verse number 12 says, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. <laughs> Slavery created problems not for the Jews, but for the Egyptians. <laughs> the more they multiplied, verse 12, and afflicted them, the more they multiplied. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. So here's what is a brother, Doug, and be careful what I say here. Preacher, what, what, I, what I find here is they, they, they kept these men long in the field working hard. So they're tired. So when they get home, they just drop sleep. You know when you're real tired, just want to sleep? But there's a God in heaven. The more they work them hard, the more the men are tired is the more they had children. That's crazy. They just couldn't stop them. 
You cannot stop the hand of God. You can fight against God. Slavery and darkness failed to diminish the population of Israel. Darkness only increased the Jews. Afflictions often appear to be that which will destroy us. But instead, it grew and built the Jews. That's a different angle to what we go through. <laughs> you know, Isaiah 54 and verse 7 says, No weapon from against you shall prosper. Suffering and persecution was like a great wave that came up against a ship on the sea. That wave wanted to destroy, but in other words, the next thing that happens, the wave, the, the boat just climb over that big wave. That's the nation of Israel. That's God's people. In the darkened times, you know, Psalm 119, God is good. God is good. Psalm 119, a unique verse. Verse 71, Psalm 119, verse 71, the Bible says, it is good for me. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. It's a perspective. It's good for me. It's good. Afflictions produces fruit. I was at a conference in Iowa. I'll be careful what I say. People don't know half of what we go through. And people ask, what's happening? I say, God is good. You know I say, I know God is good, but what's happening? Why should I bellyache? God knows. I thank God for friends. I thank God for you. Brother, I thank God for you. I thank for Brother Fish, a people he's placed in my life to help me. But he's the one. I just want to read a portion of scripture. Let's, let's read the Bible and then we'll close. Second Corinthians, God is good. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Just read it. You know, preach on that. Just read that. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse number 3. Second Corinthians 12 verse 3. And I know such a man. Whether in body, in the body, or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for man to utter. Don't you watch verse number five? You could mark that. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. Watch this. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest. Watch this, Samuel Philbert. Watch this. Least any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. Or that he heareth of me. We like people to say good things about us. Stroke our egos. That's not good for us. So Paul is saying, not to think of you or heareth of you. Look at verse 7. And least I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Watch this. There was given to me. I heard a preacher preaching on that said, anything that's given to you is a gift. Have you ever heard somebody pray for afflictions? Well, 
when we come to prayer meeting. Have you heard anybody pray for afflictions? There was given to me authority in the flesh, the message was sent to buffet me. Watch this. Least I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord, prize that might depart. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches. Wow. That's not your Bible. Is that your Bible? Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distress. For Christ's sake. For when I'm weak. Yeah. Here's what happens. I started telling you about the brother in Iowa. He came to me and said, um, of issues he's faced with. He's struggling. Difficulties that he's faced with. And God just helped me to help him. I said, have you ever, how many people have climbed the top of a mountain? You ever see any much greenery on the top of a mountain? It's always almost barren. Maybe one or two trees, but it's almost dry. You know where you find all the greenery? It's in the valleys. You know where growth is found? It's in our valleys. God sometimes brings us to the top of the mountain for us to see, to hear, and experience, to reconfirm our faith in Him. You know what God has been doing the last few weeks? He's been reconfirming my faith in Him. Look like this is gonna take off. But before long, he takes you back in the valley, because that's where you grow. All he wants you to do is to surrender your eyes. That's all he wants. For when you are weak, then he is strong. So it's no longer about us. Brother Doug. And I thank the church for praying. But God has showed himself mighty. I'm as much impatient like anything else. I want it to happen now. But God. When God steps in, everything flows. And it's just all of a sudden, a light come on. We call a guy and the guy calls somebody. All of a sudden... Everything is flowing. Wasn't God in control all the time? He sure was. But maybe I was not ready yet. Maybe we're not ready yet. Maybe God is teaching us a valuable lesson. Don't run from your darkness. I want to say this too. Struggles, brother Doug. Preacher. Spiritual, but it's also physical. Just sometimes it's hard to say that. But even failures in our lives is to help us see Him in a brighter light. Even the negatives in my life. To be honest with you, a lot of issues I struggle with. I have to seek him. There are some things I can't share with men. I share with him. And there are times I could have done better. But I've seen him work in my life. I've seen God kept me away from problems and troubles. Embrace your darkness. Embrace your struggles. Trust God. Get close to him. And see God turn that darkness into light. Don't run. Draw close.
close to him. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the darkness that you're faced with. I don't know the struggles in your life. I just want to be an encouragement. May God help us all in terms of our darkness. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.